right, we're live, guys. We're live. Let's see who shows up, who's been listening, if anyone's got my, um, my Facebook messages. So, today, today we're going to be doing a whole bunch of different expressions in English. So, I've got up here 50 common expressions used in English, just different idioms. We'll see how we go. Hopefully, you guys will like it. Let's see if I've got this camera done right. Let's see how we go. First one. The first one is a hot potato. A hot potato. So, this is when we speak of an issue, mostly current, which many people are talking about and which is usually disputed. A hot potato. So, you imagine like a potato in your hand that is hot, too hot, so you actually pass it around. So, as they say, to speak of an issue, most currently, um, which many people are talking about, which is usually disputed, it's a hot potato. It's a hot potato, so you want to pass it around. An example of this could be that um, <clears throat> I'm trying to organize something and my parents want to organize it themselves. We're fighting over it. No one can decide who wants to do it, so we're passing it around to one another. It's a hot potato. All right, what's the next one? A penny for your thoughts. A penny for your thoughts. So, this is a way of asking someone what they're thinking. If you say, oh, I'd give you a penny for your thoughts. It's like a penny, which is a small, small, small amount of money. And you want to give it to someone for their thoughts, what's going on in their mind, what they're thinking about. A penny for your thoughts. I would give you a penny for your thoughts. So, what do you think of what I'm wearing, guys? A penny for your thoughts. I'd give you a penny to tell me what you think of what I'm wearing. A penny for your thoughts. The next one is actions speak louder than words. You guys know this one? Actions speak louder than words. An action is something that you do. An action, so it's a, I don't know, it could be anything. Hitting someone, it could be running, it could be jumping, an action. And if it speaks louder than words, it's the idea of that doing something means a lot more than just saying something. So, if someone says, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do all of these things, but at the end of the day doesn't act, they don't do any actions, then that's kind of the point of this expression. Actions are more important than words. So, if you do something without words, without speaking, that's better because actions are louder than words. They're more obvious. So, people's intentions can be judged better by what they do than by what they say. Um, all right, the next one. To add insult to injury. Who knows what this one is? To add insult to injury. This one I hear quite a bit. This one, to add insult to injury means to further a loss with mockery or indignity. So, to make fun of someone after they've lost something. And so, it's like to worsen and unfavorable situation, a bad situation, to make that even worse. So, imagine that I'm skateboarding and I've fallen off the skateboard and made a fool of myself, I've embarrassed myself, it's an unfavorable situation. People, if they mock me, if they make fun of me, they're adding insult, the insult which is mocking me, joking about me, making fun of me, they're adding insult to injury. So, if you add insult to injury, it's to further a loss with mockery or indignity, according to this uh, definition here. It's just to make fun of someone when they've been injured or hurt, or it's like that double up kind of idea. Something bad's happened and then I make fun of them or tease them or insult them. So, I've added insult to their injury, to add insult to injury. All right, next one. We're getting through these fast. At the drop of a hat at the drop of a hat. This means without hesitation um, to do something instantly. So, imagine you've got your hat on your head. If I dropped it, it falls to the ground pretty quick, you know, in a split second. So, if someone does something at the drop of a hat, it means that they do something instantly, really quickly. So, if I was sitting on the couch watching TV and I was expecting takeaway food to arrive, if I hear the doorbell ring, someone could say, and he was up. He, got, he went to the door, grabbed the takeaway food at the drop of a hat. 
So he did it instantly at the drop of a hat. Um, what's another example? Imagine that I just suddenly left my house and went for a run and someone said, where's Pete? Someone else could say, oh, he just left at the drop of a hat. Just all of a sudden, without hesitation, he just left and went for a run at the drop of a hat. So what's the next one? Back to the drawing board. Who knows what this one is? Back to the drawing board. We use back to the drawing board when an attempt to do something, an attempt to complete something fails. So it's time to start again. It's time to start all over. And this one ties in with it's time to go back to scratch or to start from scratch. If we go back to the drawing board, I guess it probably comes from the idea without me looking it up of someone drawing up plans. Imagine an architect drawing up plans for a house. If those plans failed and were awful, he could scrap the plans, he could throw them away and go back to the drawing board to start drawing his plans up again. So if Aussie English failed, if no one liked Aussie English and I was like, no, no one likes it, but I want to come up with something that I can do similarly, I could say it's time to go back to the drawing board and start again. It's time to go back to scratch, it's time to start from scratch and begin again. All right, balls in your court, the balls in your court. We often use the balls in your court, and this would be, I guess, imagining that you're playing tennis to mean that it's your turn. So if I've hit the ball over your side of the net onto your side of the court, the ball is in your court. It's on your side of the court. And so it's your turn. You've got to pick up the ball and hit it back for us to keep playing. And so I could literally say, you've got the ball in your court, the ball's in your court, it's your turn, you've got to get things going, you're the one who has to decide what to do. Or I could mean this figuratively where if someone said to me, what do you want to do for dinner? Where do you want to go? What do you want to eat? Um, I could say, I don't really care, the ball's in your court. So this is the figurative idea of it's your decision, you can choose. Literally, I've hit the ball over to your side of the court and it's your turn. Figuratively, it's your decision. You can choose. So you can use this in many, many situations. It doesn't really matter. Any, anywhere in the world too, this is common everywhere. If you don't want to make the decision and it's someone else's choice, you want them to make the decision, I would just say to them, the ball is in your court. You choose, you be the judge. It's up to you. The ball's in your court. Barking up the wrong tree. Who's been listening to the podcast? You guys should all know what to bark up the wrong tree means. We went over this last week. Barking up the wrong tree. So this is looking in the place that is looking in the wrong place. So accusing the wrong person or looking in the wrong place for information. And the literal idea here would be a, tr a dog chasing a cat up a tree, the cat escaping out of this tree into another tree, but the dog still being at the base of this tree barking. So he's literally barking up the wrong tree because the cat's in this tree. He's run across, chased the cat up the tree, the cat's jumped away and he's barking up the wrong tree. He's gone to the place, he's gone to the wrong place for information. And so I could use this figuratively if I went to say a friend and I said to him, um, do you know the answer to this question or um, can you help me with this? If they said, I have absolutely no idea, can't help you, don't know, then they could say, you're barking up the wrong tree. I don't know, I don't have the answer. You're coming to me for information I don't have. You're barking up the wrong tree. To be glad to see the back of someone or something. This is usually used with a person. If you're glad to see the back of someone, it means that you're glad to see that that person has gone. So literally, if you guys are like this talking and someone turns around and walks away, you're looking at the back of that person. So you're, you can see the back of the person. So if you're glad, it means you're happy, you're content, you're stoked, you're chuffed, you're happy, you're content, you're glad to see the back of the person. So you're really happy to see them going. You're glad to see the back of someone. You could use this if you had a job, 
you're working at a restaurant and your manager's horrible, imagine you're doing that and the manager decides to quit, you could say, I'm really glad to see the back of my manager. I'm really glad they left. To beat around the bush. Do you guys know this one? We've done this one before in the past. To beat around the bush. If someone's beating around the bush, what are they doing? They're not getting to the topic. They're avoiding the topic. They're procrastinating with regards to addressing uh, a specific issue, a topic, a subject. They're beating around the bush. I don't know where this one originates from, but I think, and I've mentioned this before, the idea is that someone is beating a bush, trying to scare a bird out of the bush, and they're not directly attacking the bird, but they're beating around the bush to scare the bird out of the bush to then be shot. But in a figurative sense, I would use this if, say, I was asking someone about some information and they were going around the topic, they weren't addressing the question I was asking them. Maybe you'd use this with a politician, beating around the bush. If you're, if someone asks a, pol oh, excuse me, if someone asks a politician a question and they won't address that question, you know, you say, what are you going to do about this tax or this funding? And they say, oh, can you ask me another question about something else? You'd say they're beating around the bush. All right, what else have we got here? The best of both worlds. The best of both worlds. This means to have all the advantages, usually of two things. So two things being worlds, one world over here, one world over here. If you get the best of both, it means you get all the good things from this world and all the good things from this world. So say I worked at the museum and I had to retire soon. I was getting older and they wanted to take my job from me, but I was looking forward to retiring. If I got to retire and enjoy retiring, but at the same time they said, oh, but you can still work at the museum, that's fine. You've got the best of both worlds. You still get to do what you wanted to do at the muse museum, but you're also retired and you've got a lot more freedom. You've got the best of both worlds. Imagine too that, I don't know, you've got a car in the city and you like driving, but you're worried that um, you're gonna have to find somewhere to pay to park the car. If someone offered to pay for you to park somewhere or you share the car and you don't have to pay for the parking, you get that for free, you could say you get the best of both worlds because you can drive but you don't have to pay for this thing. The best of both worlds. Two things and you get the positive side of both of them, the two advantages. The best thing since sliced bread. This one's a common one. The best thing since sliced bread. Bread, I'm sure you all know what bread is. If you slice bread, the verb to slice, it's you take a knife or you put it through a machine that renders the bread, that makes the bread thinly cut. So it's all sliced up, completely sliced. We often refer to this in English as being like a really awesome invention from a very, very long time ago. So if you hear someone say it's the best thing since sliced bread, the basic idea here is that Something is a good invention, it's a good innovation, it's a good idea, it's a good plan, and it is the best plan, idea, innovation, or invention for a very long time since sliced bread was invented. It's the best thing since sliced bread. So this will often be used, for example, if someone picked up a hobby that they really liked, you could say to them, they think of this hobby as the best thing since sliced bread. So sliced bread was invented ages ago, donkey's years ago, and since then there hasn't been much of interest until this person has finally found, say, a hobby, surfing, I don't know, learning English, and they're obsessed with it, they love it, they think it's awesome, then you could say they think it's the best thing since sliced bread. All right. To bite off more than you can chew. To bite off more than you can chew. Do you guys know this one? To bite off more than you can chew is to take on a task that is too big for you to complete. So it's to try and attempt something, it's to try and do something that is too hard to finish, too hard to complete. So for example, if I, I could do this literally, for instance, I've got an apple and I bite literally half the apple off in my mouth 
then I could say that the piece that I've bitten off is so big, I can't, I can't actually chew. I've literally bitten off more than I can chew because I've bitten off half the apple and it's too big for me to chew. But also figuratively, biting off half the apple and it being too big for me to chew is figuratively a task that is too hard to complete. So it's too hard, it's too um, difficult, it's too big a task uh, for me to complete. So I've bitten off more than I can chew. I'll do one more and then I'll open it up into questions, into question time. So this is where you'll get to ask me any questions you like, any questions at all. A blessing in disguise. A blessing is like something that's really good. It's, um, that's a difficult one to, to define. But if you have a blessing in disguise, it's something that is um, good that isn't recognized at first. So that's the idea of it being disguised. Someone's wearing a disguise and you can't see them. You don't know who they are. You don't know what they are. And if it's a blessing in disguise, it's like that blessing has been disguised. That good thing, the really positive thing has been disguised and then revealed itself at the end. So imagine that I lost my job and then a month after I lost my job, the building that I used to work in burnt down and everyone died. I could say, you know, although that's an incredibly unfortunate situation, that losing my job was a blessing in disguise. It was a thing that happened that was negative at the time and I was really disappointed and that's what the disguise was, that it was, it looked like it was bad, but then later I realized it was actually a blessing. It was actually a really positive thing because it saved my life. It's a blessing in disguise. All right, so any questions, guys? Any questions? What can I help you guys with regarding English? What do you want to chat about? You guys have to give me something so that I can rabbit on, so that I can talk on. Where is the pancake? Has the price... Ah, okay, Pancake Parlor is the place. Hang. We went there recently. So in Melbourne, you can go to a place called Pancake Parlor in the Melbourne Central CBD. So Melbourne Central is the mall in the middle of the city. And there's a pancake parlor there. You can sign up online and I think they give you pancakes in winter for the price that is the temperature. So if it gets down to zero degrees, you literally get um, pancakes for free. No, I think parlor spelled P-A-L-O-U-R. I think that's right. Actually, it may be P-A-R. This isn't a word that I use very often. It's my English skills suck. Yeah, I believe it's P-A-R-L-O-U-R. Hopefully that makes sense. Pancake parlor. Lore. Parlor, except with an R after the A. So what are you guys up to at the moment? What are you tackling? What questions do you have? Around the world, Ibrahim, there's a lot of teachers. <laughs> but thank you, dude. I'm glad you enjoy the lessons. Mm. So what are you guys currently having trouble with English-wise? What has been difficult? Prepositions, phrasal verbs, expressions? Do you have any questions about Australia? Anything that I can answer in the next 20 to 30 minutes? Ask away. Okay, in fact, I think I can look up. There were some questions that I had on the Aussie English Facebook page. So maybe I'll just dig some of these up, guys, and use them as a starting point until you guys start asking me some questions. What do we got here? So, Gabriel Ruiz, or who is, if he's Brazilian, wants to know what the difference between off and away is uh, in regards to phrasal verbs. That's a complicated question. That is quite a complicated question. I think off the top of my head, off can be used for things like to remove part of something. So if I cut something off something else, it means remove it. If I push something off the table, it's taking it from being on the table. Imagine you've got a table here and it's going off the table. Away tends to be the idea of distance. 
So if I walk away, it's that I'm creating distance between two things by walking. If I swim away, it means that I'm swimming and creating distance. Off the top of my head, I think it can also mean that you're doing something like crazy. So you're doing it a lot of that thing. So imagine at the moment I am um, talking away on the Aussie English channel at the moment, meaning I'm talking a lot. If, if I was in my bedroom writing and doing a lot of it, doing it like crazy, you could say I'm writing away, writing away, writing away. Off would be that idea of separating things. There's probably quite a few other phrasal verbs, especially irregular ones um, for something to go off. That would be for something to explode. You know, you just have to learn those kinds of things. But the, diff the main difference would be separation using off um, with regards to taking a part of something away from the rest of it. So you're pulling it off, you're biting it off, you're taking it off. Separation like that, whereas away would mean creating distance between two things. He's walking away from me. Uh, he's running away from me or doing something like crazy. He's riding away. He's speaking away. He's screaming away in the background. So I hope that helps. What are some other questions here? Boom, boom, boom. Just let me scroll up. Irregular nouns. Can you think of some? A lot of these, um, Kiki, are the old ones that are related to old English and Germanic English because these guys had cases and so instead of putting S on the end to make them plural, they actually had different forms that would go on the ends of words. So for instance, an ox, but two oxen. An ox is like a bull. It's a, a kind of livestock. If you have one of them, it's an ox, O-X. If there's two of them, it's oxen, oxen, O-X-E-N. So that's like child and children, child and children, uh, woman, women, man, men. Those ones you just have to learn. The good thing is there's not very many of them and they're all pretty common. A lot of them might be animals as well. So for instance, you might have, um, what's an example? A goose and geese, um, one fish, two fish. You can say fishes if they're different species though. Those ones you just have to learn, but worst case scenario, just put an S on the end and if someone wants to correct you, they'll do it. All right, so get away versus get off. Uh, Huang, get away would mean to escape. Uh, get off, you probably wouldn't use that to mean escape, although it could be. He's gotten off up the hill, he's gotten off um, away from us, but I would probably tend to use away. I would say he's run away, he's walked away. If it was off, he's walked off. It's as opposed to escape, that to me in my head makes me think more of disappear, he's gone. So more so than someone's tried to evade capture, they've tried to escape, it's more the idea of they've just disappeared. They've walked away, they've walked off, they've disappeared. Um, what? I don't know when to use kind of, sort of, or type of. I think all of those are interchangeable. Off the top of my head, you would say he's, um, oh, okay, okay, okay. If you're talking about a thing, so it's a noun after these things, it's a kind of something. It's a sort of something. It's a type of something. They're all interchangeable. If you want to place an adjective after this though, you would only use kind of and sort of. And so if I wanted to say that guy's really annoying and use one of these, I could say he's kind of annoying or he's sort of annoying, which means that he is somewhat. He's not really annoying and he's not really not annoying. He's in the middle there. He's, he's kind of, he's sort of, but type of type is um, species. It's, it's the... It's an object, you would use that with a noun, like Apple is a type of computer. Um, PC is a kind of computer, it's a sort of computer. But if you use an adjective, so the way that you describe someone, you would use kind of a sort of, and they're interchangeable. He's kind of happy, he's sort of annoying, he's kind of sad, he's sort of frustrated. You can just switch them in and out as you want. Phrasal verbs, always phrasal verbs. What else have we got here? What is the difference between a verb? Oh, this is a long one. Let me open it up. 
What is the difference between a verb with up or out and verb without them? For example, to work, to work out, to read, to read up. That's a difficult question. These are very, very subtle differences. Work by itself is like to function or to, um, well, to literally work. I don't know if I can use anything to say that more simply. So it would be like if you work, you go to work, you go to a place and you sit down and um, I can't think of a, a simpler verb to use, but you work, you, you do things there. If you work something out, so that's where the phrasal verb is separable. You can work out something or you can work something out. That means to discover, to uh, figure out, to examine and solve. So you'd work out a problem. You would work a problem out. It depends on how you want to say it, but you can split it. Um, you could also use work out as in to work out, to go to the gym and do weights. I think that's one of those irregular phrasal verbs where it doesn't, out doesn't really make sense there, but it's used there. <clears throat> I'm not exactly sure why we use out with words like work out and figure out, try out. Um, I'll have to look into that. I can't tell you that off the top of my head, unfortunately. With regards to read and read up, here up means to completion. So it would be like, I'm going to read a book, but you would read up on a subject. Or it could mean that you finish the book. I'm going to read. You wouldn't use it with read, but like, for instance, if I was eating and someone said eat up, it would be like eat to the point of finishing. Drink up, drink to the point of finishing. So if I had a drink here, I could drink it. So I'm drinking a little bit or I could drink the whole thing. It's kind of ambiguous as to whether I drink a little bit or a lot. Whereas if someone said to you drink up or eat up, it means finish it, finish it. If you read up on something though, that means to better learn about it, to investigate it, to study it, to read up on a subject. So I might read up on maths. I might read up on um, how to do karate. I might read up on evolution. I might read up on teaching English. I might read up on the grammar later on for why we use phrasal verbs without because I don't know the exact answer. So to read up on something. So it's a difficult question, but you'll, you'll get an idea for this. I'll, I'll do some stuff in the future where I'll go over up and out and the verbs that they, they go with commonly and the different ways that they're used. But yeah, just keep using them, keep practicing them, and you'll start to see the patterns that emerge. What are some other questions? Can you please pronounce YouTube, during, and duration? So the difference there I think that you're trying to get at is YouTube is like a ch, ch, ch. If it's a T-U, we say it as Chew, so it's like a ch, you tube. With wor with words that start with d and then have a u, it's more like a j sound, ju. So I'd say it like during and duration. Whereas you tube, it's a ch sound instead of a j, j j j, like a j, and ch, like a ch. And the difference between those two is that j is unvoc no j is vocalized the j is vocalized so it makes it requires noise j j whereas ch ch is a ch 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 it's unvocalized and then followed by a vowel sound i hope that helps somebody say bloody 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 there you go just started listening to the podcast i'm from sao paulo brazil uh, arriving in Melbourne in 20 days, how's your Portuguese going? Uh, não é muito bem neste momento, mas estou aprendendo. Not very good at the moment, but I'm learning. Um, thanks for your explanation, you're welcome. I don't understand the present past subjunctive. Oh my god, you're telling me. Present past subjunctive, all right. I'd have to look that up, to be honest, Kiki. Let's have a look, let's see if we can find some. Present versus past subjunctive in English. See, it's funny, I know the subjunctive in French, but I wouldn't be able to tell you how to use it in English off the top of my head. Let's find 
Um, okay, present. It is essential that she be present. It was essential that she be here. Uh, okay. These are the kinds of things in English learning the thing subjunctive is freaking high level English. This is the kind of thing the average person isn't going to use, let alone know what it is in English. So, um, yeah, I wouldn't worry too much about learning this stuff, although if you want to, go for it. The trick to this, that's sort of like the trick in French, is to learn the preceding phrase that leads up to where you would use the subjunctive. So, it is essential that, it's essential that, it's required that, it's important that um, she be here, she be present, he does, or he do his homework. So, this is the weird thing, it uses the infinitive of the verb, I believe, not, it's not conjugated into the present tense. So, you would say, it's important that I do my homework, it's important that I be here to help, it's important that I have your assistance, it's important to. The thing in my mind with the subjunctive is the sentence before it that tells me about whether or not to use it. So, I would learn those. It's essential that he be here, but most people are going to say it's essential that he's here. It's essential that he does his homework. They're just going to use the present tense. Up to you, up to you. Let's get through some more of these. Can you please explain to go all out, flat chat, fl full throttle, <laughs> flat out like a lizard drinking? Oh my gosh, Richie, that's a good one. So, to go all out, to go flat chat, to go full throttle, to go flat out like a lizard drinking all mean the same thing, all exactly the same thing and they effectively mean to just do 100%, give something 100%. The most simple one here I would imagine is to go all out and you have to use all in there, you can't say to go out, you have to say to go all out and the idea there would be that you're spending everything that you have, you're going all out. I'm not sure if this is the opposite of the idea of going all in, which is what you would do if you're playing a card game and you bet all of your money. If you push all your money in, all in to the center where all the bets are going, then you're going all in. So you're saying, I'm going to go all in, I'm going all in, I'm putting all of my money into the center for this hand, I'm going all in. If you go all out, the idea is the same thing, but in this sense, it's more expenditure of energy. So, if someone um, was driving their car and they were driving it all out, they were going all out, it would be they're driving as fast as they can, they're going flat chat, they're going full throttle, they're going flat out like a lizard drink drinking. Flat chat would be the idea of having your pedal in the car pushed to the bottom. I don't know where this originates from, I'm sure chat here probably has something to do with that, but flat chat would be full throttle, the same thing there. Full throttle and flat chat is to push all the way down on the accelerator and to be going 100%, to be going as fast as possible, to be going all out, to be doing as much as possible, to be going flat chat. Those two though would be more used with regards to speed. So you can't really go flat chat and full throttle the same way that you can go all out. What are some examples? Um, I could spend a lot of money on decorating my house and I've gone all out. If I spend a heap of money, more than I should have, I've gone all out, no expense spared, I've completely done up the house and made the house look amazing, I've gone all out. You can't say in that sense, I've gone flat chat or I've gone uh, full throttle because it's got nothing to do with speed. So, flat chat, full throttle would be doing something quickly. Whether you're physically in a car, driving as quickly as possible, or whether you're trying to complete a task that requires time, that requires you to do it quickly, then you could say also, I'm going flat chat, I'm going full speed at trying to complete the task at hand. So, if I'm at work and I need to get all this stuff done, and if I'm doing it incredibly quickly, I could say, yeah, 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 I'm going all out, like I'm trying to do it as quickly as possible and I could go all out in the sense that I'm trying to do it as well as possible, as, um, you know, as good as I should, but then if I'm doing it as quickly as I can, I'm going flat chat, I'm going full throttle. 
And the same thing you could say flat out. I'm going flat out. I'm going as quick as possible. But then we also say flat out like a lizard drinking. The idea being that the lizard's tongue is flicking into the water really, really quickly to get the water up into its mouth. And so it's going flat out. It's going as quick as it can. It's going really fast. Full throttle, flat out. So that was a long explanation, but I hope it helps, Ruchi. What else have we got here? What does champagne taste on the beer budget mean? Champagne taste on the beer budget. That's an interesting one. That's the kind of expression that I haven't heard before, but I can definitely gauge, I can definitely work out what it means. To have a champagne taste on a beer budget or on the beer budget would mean that champagne's the expensive thing and beer is the cheap thing. And if you only have the budget to pay for beer, it means all you can afford is beer, but you have the taste, you have the enjoyment of, you prefer champagne. So it would be like, I hate beer and I don't drink beer. I love champagne, but I only have enough money to pay for beer. So I can't really afford, I have really good taste. I have really high quality taste, but my budget is really low. So I have champagne taste on a beer budget. I hope that helps. Any more questions before I bail, guys? Can I help you with any other stuff, English-wise? Any other expressions, phrasal verbs? Anything else you want to chat about before I go to my next lesson? Hit me up. Give me some questions quickly, guys. Go for it. I might close down some of these windows. Mm -hmm. Remember to chuck them in the comments here, guys. I'm not sure what the delay is. So I'm always worried that if I close it down, that I'm going to miss questions coming in. So make sure you chuck them in the comments section there quickly. Let me know what you want answered and what I can discuss, what I can chat about, what I can rabbit on about. Let's see. I think I had another question on the Aussie English website. So maybe I'll go and jump over. Have a quick squiz, have a quick look. Hopefully you guys remember what a squiz is. A squiz is to have a look. No more questions on here yet? All right. Ah, okay. Anani asks, what do you mean when you say my plate is full? And can you give me some examples? I would use this if I've got too much to do. So if I have too many tasks that I have to complete, if I have too much on my plate, which is probably the expression you're going to hear more, too much on my plate, it means that it's like you've got too much food on your plate that you're not going to be able to eat it. So the basic idea there being that if you have too much on your plate, you have too much to do that you can't complete all of it. So for instance, if I was incredibly busy today, if I had a lot to do, I had to go to the shops, I had to go to work, I had to go study, I had to give listen, uh, lessons, and then someone else said, oh, can you also do this? Can you also um, come over and hang out? Can you also blah, blah, blah? I might say, I can't, I've got too much on my plate. My plate's full today. I can't help you, mate, I'm really sorry. I've got way too much on my plate at the moment. I might also use this if someone said, um, okay, maybe I had a business teaching guitar and someone's come along and said, I've got 10 new students that I'd love you to take on. Do you have any room for them? Can you take on 10 new students? If I had no room because I have too many students already, I might say, I can't, man. I have way too much on my plate. My plate is full. Um, there's no way I can take on all of that extra work, all those extra students. Uh, my plate's full. Sorry about that, man. Too much on my plate. All right. What's the difference between will and would? Oh, it's difficult, isn't it? Ninos asks, what's the difference between will and would? Will is the future tense. So you would use this to talk about something that is going to happen in the future. So it will happen. Would is the idea that something has the potential to or that you want it to. So it's the conditional, but it's not certain. So that's answering this off the top of my head, but I would use will if it's definite. I will go to see you tomorrow. I would use would if it's uncertain or if it, it can't happen, but it's something I would like. 
So I would like to see you tomorrow, but I'm not sure if I can. So there we go. It's I would like to, but I would love to. I would love to. I would like to. I really would love to see you, but I'm not sure if I can or but I have to do this first. I would, but I would, but I will is just a statement. It's going to happen. I will see you tomorrow. I've decided this is definite. It's certain I will see you. Would has a few other more complex uh, ways that it can be used, such as uh, the past tense. You can use this like used to. These are interchangeable. You can use would and used to to talk about something that you did in the past habitually. So I could say that when I was a kid, I would go to the beach every day. So I did it every day. It's habitual. It's something that I did all the time. I did it repeatedly all the time. So I could say instead of, I used to go to the beach all the time, I would go to the beach all the time. My dad would cook dinner every evening. My mum would come home from work at five. My sister would be really annoying. And this is all in the past, in the past. So this is the kind of thing where it's a repeated action. It happened all the time. It was habitual. She would really annoy me. Dad, used, dad would cook me dinner. Mum would get home at five, would. But most often, you're probably going to hear this in the conditional. I would do this, but. Or in the conditional past, I would have done this, but I couldn't. Or but I um, wouldn't have been able to. So I hope that helps, Nina's. What else have we got here? What's an emblem? What's the national emblem, emblem of Australia? This is an emblem, I guess in this sense, so it's a symbol, an emblem, it's a symbol that represents something. In the case of Portello Rosso here, it's the restaurant I work at. If it's the Australian emblem, it's um, the coat of arms, I think, with a kangaroo and an emu on the other side of the emblem. And Australia has always got this weird sort of um, story that goes around about us being the only country in the world that eats our national emblem, being the, the emu and the kangaroo are both food. We eat them. You can buy them in the supermarket. And you could also refer to it as the coat of arms, which is that shield with the uh, picture on it, so the emblem. What's the difference between that and this? <clears throat> Distance. So these are both, I think, demonstrative pronouns from my memory. And the plural of that and this are those and these. And the only difference is you're talking about something that at least in the case of demonstrative pronouns, I just said that, but it meant something else. Um, this is close to me. This thing, if it's away from me, it's not connected to me, it's that. This, that. Um, if I'm holding my computer, this is my computer. If my computer is on the other side of the room, that's my computer over there. That's my computer. If I've got two computers, these are my computers, if I'm holding them. If they're in front of me, if they're close to me, these are my computers. If they're over the other side of the room, those are my computers. So this, that, these, those. Hope that helps. Anyway guys, I think we're running out of questions. So if you have nothing else you would like me to answer, I might bail, I might log off, I might call it quits for the night and go and do a few other things. I'll give you a few more minutes, see if anyone has any more questions, make sure you put them below, but if you guys have nothing else that you'd like to know, nothing else you'd like to talk about, English-wise, Australia-wise, anything-wise, then I'm probably going to head off and get ready for my next lesson. So. I'll give you a few seconds, but thank you so much for joining. Sorry about the technical difficulties. The um, internet's been playing up here, so I had to switch on to my phone and use the uh, internet on my phone instead of the internet here. So the previous episode was separate. I had to end it and restart. I'll try and join them together. So I'll try and put them together and put them on YouTube as usual, guys. And I've just started recently chopping these videos up and taking different explanations out and turning them into separate videos that I'm going to upload onto the website for members. 
So you guys will get transcripts for these. You'll be able to look through these videos like a library and go through and learn about any of the stuff we've ever gone over, but more simply because I will have chopped it up. So you'll have all of these expressions on their own separate little videos that you can get access to if you sign up to be a member on Aussie English. And if you want to learn English fast, I definitely, I definitely recommend that you give it a go. You can try it for a dollar. Go to the Aussie English podcast at www.theaussieenglishpodcast.com. Click learn English faster and sign up. It's a dollar for one week. Give it a go. You get bonus exercises for all the expression episodes on the podcast. There are some mini pronunciation courses that will teach you how to speak as English like me. I'm slowly building this up and adding more to it, but go and have an explore. See what you think. The exercises there are really designed to help you speak Australian English and understand Australian English like a native. So give it a go. I know a lot of you are already members and I really appreciate that. Thank you so much, guys. Um, but yeah, I'm always here for your feedback too. If you guys want more, if you guys think I should be trying different things, talking about different things, anything you want, get in contact with me, send me a message, send me an email, chat to me on Facebook. Um, I'm always there to chat to you guys. So feel free to reach out and um, say good day. So I might leave it at that, guys. Thank you so much for watching. And I'll chat to you soon. Peace out.